Hey there, game developers. Six Days in Fallujah is coming out 12 years after its cancellation. Six Days in Fallujah is a serious game about the Second Battle of Fallujah in the Iraq War. A serious game is a game that has some other primary goal than entertainment. A serious game could be designed to teach or inform players, such as an educational game or a news game. A serious game could also be designed to persuade or manipulate the player, such as a recruitment game or a propaganda game. The original concept for Six Days in Fallujah was an accurate and authentic recreation of what it was like to have fought in that battle. The developer claims that they aren't making a political statement. You can't make a game about the Second Battle of Fallujah without talking about the Iraq War. You can't talk about the Iraq War without talking about the War on Terror, and the War on Terror is an inherently political subject. You can't make a game about the Second Battle of Fallujah without making a political statement. And even if you don't intend to make a political statement, your audience will interpret one from your game. This is why Six Days in Fallujah got canceled in the first place. The publisher pulled their funding after people complained that they were afraid that the game would disrespect the death of real Marines, and the developer was even on Fox & Friends to defend their game back in 2009. Making this game as a first-person shooter where you play as a coalition soldier in Fallujah is an inherently political choice. Players and multiplayer will always be depicted as coalition soldiers, and this decision was made for political reasons. The developers could have chosen to make a civilian their protagonist, like in This War of Mine, but they didn't. They also could have chosen to make insurgents playable, but they didn't. The Frequently Asked Questions page of their website even mentions stealth levels, where the player is an unarmed civilian, but these levels aren't the focus of the game. The developers interviewed veterans, civilians, and even insurgents during the development of the game, and they intended to include the recordings of these interviews as part of the released game. I want to be clear that it's a good thing that all sides were being listened to. History is typically written by the victors. It can be very difficult to make a game about a tragic or traumatic real-world event. It can be challenging to tackle serious or difficult subjects in games because many people view games as fun or as frivolous time wasters that are meant for children. Film, art, and literature have been able to tackle these kinds of subjects a lot easier. Sometimes the best option for a documentary is to create a film rather than a game. However, if you believe that games are an art form, or that they can have the same cultural significance as film or literature, then we should strive to create games with cultural significance. Schindler's List tackles some of the horrors of the Holocaust, but it's risky to try and build a game about the Holocaust. When you're trying to tackle a subject like the Holocaust, you either do it right or you do it horribly wrong. It's impossible to ignore the bigger picture of what happened in Fallujah if you're creating a game to teach people about the Second Battle of Fallujah. I never thought I'd be talking about the Iraq War when I started doing these videos about game industry news, but let's take a look at the history of Operation Phantom Fury, also known as the Second Battle of Fallujah. We need to look at the events leading up to the battle to understand what happened. I spent several hours researching this, which is why it took more than a day to record and release this video. There are going to be a lot of sources cited in the video description down below. On April 28th, 2003, Iraqi civilians protested outside of a school that American soldiers had taken over within the city of Fallujah. The protesters demanded that the soldiers leave so the children could return to school. When the crowd refused to disperse, American soldiers fired into the crowd of Iraqi civilians. The soldiers claimed that they were receiving fire from the crowd, whereas the civilians said they were shot at first. Human Rights Watch, which inspected the area after the incident, found no physical evidence of shots fired at the building where the U.S. forces were based. According to locals, the United States soldiers fired upon the unarmed crowd, killing 17 and wounding more than 70 of the protesters. The American soldiers suffered no deaths and no wounds from this incident. Two days later, 
Three more unarmed civilians were killed by American soldiers during a daytime protest in front of the Ba'ath Party headquarters. It should be noted that these soldiers also claimed that the unarmed civilians fired on them first. Our soldiers shooting and killing unarmed protesters galvanized public opinion against America within Fallujah. Before this, many of the people actually welcomed the end of Saddam Hussein's regime, and the city had been leaning pro-American. This was also the beginning of waves of insurgents using guerrilla warfare tactics to fight against American soldiers. Within one year, the U.S. had withdrawn all troops, from the city to a base just outside of the city. Instead of sending troops into the city, the army preferred to outsource this work to private military contractors, which is a fancy euphemism for mercenary companies. And this is where the private military contractor Blackwater Security enters our story. Now you may have seen that name in the news recently, one of Trump's final actions as president was to pardon four Blackwater security employees that killed 14 unarmed civilians in Iraq in what is now known as the Nisor Square Massacre. In 2004, Blackwater security sent some of its employees into Fallujah, where they were ambushed and killed on video. The charred remains of the contractors were strung up over the Euphrates River. Now keep in mind that this was an election year. So politicians had to appear tough on terror. The Marines were ordered to attack the city in retaliation. And that attack brings us to the first Battle of Fallujah, or Operation Vigilant Resolve. This battle is the point in the Iraq War where public opinion was swayed decisively against the United States. Images of American soldiers killing unarmed civilians were broadcast across the country. The military bombed the city and killed hundreds of civilians. Iraq citizens went from wanting to work with the United States to rebuild their country to just wanting the soldiers out of the country. Immediately after the ceasefire that ended the First Battle of Fallujah, the U.S. withdrew from the city and once again outsourced their operations, this time to the newly formed Fallujah Brigade which was a security force trained by the CIA and armed by the U.S. military. By September, the Fallujah Brigade had aligned with the insurgents in the fight against the United States. This was three months before the presidential election in the United States, and this brings us to the Second Battle of Fallujah. The United States troops weren't alone in this battle. The United States had 10,500 troops. The United Kingdom had 850 troops, and Iraq had 2,000 security forces for a combined 13,350 troops. These troops were up against an estimated 3,700 to 4,000 insurgents. So the coalition outnumbered the insurgents three to one. The coalition blockaded the city and bombed it for eight weeks before sending in troops. Before attacking the city, the Marines stopped men of fighting age from leaving. Different sources list different age ranges, and I haven't been able to confirm which age range was used in this battle. However, this is very similar to a policy that is still in place today. When the United States kills someone with a drone strike, all military age males that are geographically close to the target of the strike are not counted as civilians. They are counted as terrorists or insurgents, unless they are proven innocent after their death. In this case, military age is defined as 16 years old or older. This is an important point that we'll get back to later in this video. Many civilians remained inside the city, but the United States Marines were told that the civilians had fled. The lack of civilians would have allowed the troops to use incendiary munitions and thermobaric weapons. 
Thermobaric weapons were used on buildings to cause the roof to collapse and kill the people inside of the building. The United States troops used white phosphorus munitions in this battle. White phosphorus munitions are incendiary munitions that burn the flesh of those that come into contact with the particles. The use of incendiary munitions on civilians violates a United Nations treaty that the United Kingdom signed in 1995 but we didn't sign this treaty until the day after Obama was inaugurated. An estimated 581 to 670 civilians were killed, and thousands of civilians were rendered homeless because the coalition destroyed their homes. Estimates for insurgent deaths range from 1,200 to 1,500 killed, depending on the source. However, if you recall from earlier, the military allegedly forbid military-aged males from fleeing the city, and we assume that any military-aged male in a combat zone was an insurgent unless they were proven innocent after their death. Some of those that were counted as insurgents were likely young males that were unable to flee the city. In the years since the battle, there have been dramatic increases in infant mortality, congenital defects, cancer, and leukemia in Fallujah. The radiation from depleted uranium rounds used by coalition troops has contaminated the city of Fallujah, and it continues to kill civilians to this day. I really don't want to end this video on this depressing of a note, and I would like to mention something good that the developers are doing. A portion of the proceeds from Six Days at Fallujah will be donated to organizations supporting the coalition service members and Iraqi civilians who have been most affected by the war on terror. Their focus will be on those who traditional relief efforts are not yet reaching. Marines, soldiers, and civilians who helped them create the game will be deeply involved in directing those donations. Unfortunately, there is no mention of what portion of the proceeds or what charities will be receiving the money. If you would like more daily game industry updates, then please subscribe to my channel. I try to post new videos every weekday, but this video required two days to make due to the amount of research that I had to do for it.